Okay, well, let's go ahead and get started. So once again, let me thank everybody for uh, taking a bit of time out of your Wednesday afternoon to learn about some great science that's going on at Green Bank Observatory. I'm Karen O'Neill. I'm the director here at Green Bank Observatory. And we will start off uh, today with me just giving you a quick uh, overview of some of the stuff going on here on site. And then, of course, we'll hand it off to our uh, primary uh, presenter, Steve Croft, who will be talking about Breakthrough Listen and some of the uh, great work that they've been doing. So as always, when we start these off, we uh, talk about what's on everybody's mind and everybody's discussions all the time anyway, which is uh, COVID-19 and the, the current pandemic. Uh, the number of uh, vaccinations across uh, the, the state of West Virginia, where we are, is uh, very slowly creeping up or remains uh, quite low still at about 54%. Within our county, it's a little bit higher at about 60%. Um, hopefully, we'll continue to see that to go up. Um, unfortunately, at the same time, we're seeing the number of uh, cases going up quite uh, quite high. And um, uh, so within the state of West Virginia, as you can see in the bottom left, the number of cases right now is higher than it's ever been with COVID pandemic. So we continue to hope that people get vaccinated and a lot of the uh, cases will, will get back under control again. Here on site though, things are going much better than that. Of course, all of our site are uh, fully vaccinated or with accommodations. So almost everybody here on site is vaccinated. We still have health checks and masks as we have all along. Other than that, we remain in full operations as I've been talking about for a while. And the Science Center has reopened, although we recommend reservations if you decide to come down here as we are trying to limit the number of guests that we have within the facility to keep things safe. Uh, quite excitingly on, on site here, the new data center is under construction. You can see this in the image. So what you see here is a, a metal building, which is our RFI shielded room. So this is to protect ourselves from all of the, the noise that our data center is going to make, all the radio frequency noise it's going to make. And then surrounding that is a shell right now of a shelter that will protect it better from the weather. Uh, we're building it this way just because the RFI shielded room is, of course, a a very expensive and very uh, uh, system that we want to protect as best we can. So we're just providing additional weatherproofing onto that to protect from the snow and things like that here. So the, uh, the shielded building itself should be done within about a week and then we'll start to populate the inside of that. And we're looking forward to having this whole system up and running sometime within the next six to 12 months. So it's quite exciting for us. Hand in hand with that, we've had some uh, recent success with the archive access tool. So for those of you that aren't familiar with this, we actually are uh, partnered with the National Radio Astronomy Observatory and NREO has built an archive access tool and they're ingesting a lot of the GBT data into it, uh, focusing on open skies data and focusing on uh, the data that is within our archives. So that doesn't include some pulsar search data, for example, and things like that. Uh, very soon you should see an announcement that the GBT data is now in the archive access tool. It's not all the data, it's just for about a seven year period but we're still excited to see this happen. And once this is up and running, we'll be able to start ingesting the remaining of the data into the system. So that will be uh, announced hopefully very, very soon. And then we'll get to start moving the rest of the existing archive data into the system. And then simultaneously starting to think about how we expand that with our new data center in order to include additional data into that and get all of our open skies data into the data archive eventually. So that's exciting something that's been uh, being worked on for a couple of years now. So we're happy to know it's coming to fruition. Uh, finally on site, just to let you guys know. So we just uh, completed the uh, Green Bank and Arecibo single dish school. That was very successful as a hybrid model. And uh, we're now working on the dates for next year, both for that as well as for our observers workshops. And those announcements should be out soon, well before the AAS meeting. Uh, in case anybody's interested, we also have a number of job openings on site. Uh, you can see those here. Uh, including a new posting of a data analyst. And uh, so if anybody's interested in working at the observatory or at any of the AUI facilities, I encourage you to take a look at the uh, web's link that you see down there, greenbankobservatory.org slash about slash careers. So with that, uh, last thing I just want to mention is our community Zooms are continuing. So in two weeks, we have our own Dave Frere talking about uh, GBT observations and ga of gas and luminous infrared galaxies. And then after that, Amanda Kepler will be talking about observing dense molecular gas in uh, nearby galaxies. So with that, I will thank you guys once again for your, your time with all of this and hand this off to Jay to introduce today's speaker. So Jay, it's all yours. Thanks very much. Yeah, our speaker today is Stephen Croft from UC Berkeley, and he's going to be talk, telling us about Breakthrough Listen on the GBT, how the world's biggest steerable dish is engaging in the world's biggest SETI program. 
If you have questions, please submit them on the Q&A button in your lower right, and uh, I will uh, deal with those as they arise. Okay, Steve, take it away. Thanks, Jay, and uh, thanks, Karen. Thanks, everyone, for the invitation uh, to speak. I'm going to share my slides. Hopefully, you can see uh, my slide now. Um, so I'm the project scientist for the Breakthrough Lesson Program on the Green Bank Telescope, and we're one of the largest users of the GBT um, with about 20% of the time on the telescope. Um, I'm also the director of our Research Experience for Undergraduates program. So this is an NSF-funded REU, um, if any of you are undergraduate students watching this talk, or if you have undergraduate students that are interested in uh, getting involved, not just with the work that we're doing with the GBT, but with some of the other telescopes um, in our, our SETI search, uh, then uh, please feel free to get in touch with me or to look out for our announcement um, for applications, which will be opening in December of this year. So um, looking up in the night sky, we see uh, thousands of stars visible to the naked eye. We see uh, billions of stars, hundreds of billions of stars in the Milky Way galaxy. And we see uh, hundreds of billions of galaxies in uh, our observable universe. And we've learned in the past few years that uh, probably about 20% of those stars have a planet in the habitable zone that potentially could support life. Uh, so there's a lot of places out there, it's a lot of real estate potentially where life could arise. And the search for life has really become a focus for uh, for NASA and for other funding agencies um, and the field of astrobiology has really been growing over the last few years, uh, really driven by some of the instrumentation that enables us to um, perform searches for, uh, for signs of life, um, both by uh, uh, going there um, uh, in person uh, or at least sending our, our proxies or our robots out there to, to places in the solar system and by making remote sensing observations. Uh, but as of yet, um, we haven't found any signs of life out there. And to sort of paraphrase uh, Enrico Fermi and Fermi's paradox, um, where is everybody? Uh, you know, what do, we, what do we need to do to actually uh, find this evidence? And so, you know, I mentioned we can go there, we can do in-situ sampling by uh, sending instruments like the Mars rovers uh, that are actually kind of going and basically sniffing the dirt on Mars for, for signs of life. Uh, we can do remote sensing, and this is really kind of um, pushing the limits of the technology of things like James Webb, hopefully going to launch later this year, and then the 30 meter class telescopes that will be coming online over the next few years, and really the next generation of telescopes after that, that will be able to make the kind of measurements that will be necessary to distinguish between uh, worlds without life or worlds without biosignatures, such as uh, Venus and Mars in our own solar system, and worlds like Earth uh, that have signs of this chemistry that may be an indicator of, uh, of biology there. It's worth pointing out that uh, the places that we can reach for these biosignature searches are pretty limited. Um, this is a very hard measurement to make, uh, even uh, for the, the nearest stars and planets to Earth. Um, and so there's really only a handful of stars, even with this next generation of technology, that are going to be searchable for biosignatures. And so the third sort of leg of astrobiology, in addition to um, in situ sampling and remote sampling for biosignatures, is the search for technosignatures, motivated by the idea that here on Earth, biology eventually developed intelligence, intelligence developed technology, and some of these technologies, uh, powerful radio transmitters, uh, maybe powerful lasers, uh, maybe sort of extrapolating forwards a little bit from Earth circa 2021, um, the ability to build large structures in orbit around stars could potentially be detectable at interstellar distances. And really this expands the search space from the handful of stars that we can search for biosignatures to potentially tens of thousands or even millions of stars where we can perform a technosignature search. So even if technology is relatively rare compared to, uh, to simple life, then it's worth doing the search because it can really sort of give us a handle on um, how many worlds out there, how many of those billions of worlds in our own galaxy might have uh, intelligent life there. So the modern SETI search really started um, at Green Bank. Uh, here, many of you, of course, will not recognize uh, Frank Drake, uh, the telescope in the background that was used for the Project Osma search uh, in 1960. And this was the, the first modern SETI search. So essentially what you're doing is scanning through the radio dial, looking for artificial transmissions, pointing the telescope at uh, nearby stars. And the problems that Frank had in the 1960s are the same as the problems that we have today, that Earth, technology interferes with the search. The things that we're looking for using these telescopes are um, the same things that we have uh, here on Earth, transmission technologies uh, that really are kind of this, this haystack in which we're looking for the needle 
of a signal from extraterrestrial intelligence. And so I just want to tell you a little bit about how we do that practically uh, now with the system that we have. And so um, here we are um, uh, with the, the Green Bank Telescope today. That's our chief engineer um, for Breakthrough Listen, Dave McMahon, looking up at the telescope there. Um, this was actually uh, during the, the summer painting. You can see uh, the, the painters who've just rappelled down from underneath the dish there. Um, so we're really uh, very um, excited to have access to, to the GBT, the world's largest steerable dish. Um, to do, uh, as, as uh, I said in the title, the world's largest search for techno signatures, 20% uh, of the time on the GBT, with some of the most capable digital instrumentation that's been deployed really at any radio telescope anywhere in the world. So here's that back end instrumentation. We actually have um, two sets of racks uh, in uh, the, the main building there out at Green Bank. Uh, you can look in these, uh, these papers here for more details about the instrumentation and about the data. Uh, the just a few technical specs that these these racks enable us to get 12 gigahertz of instantaneous bandwidth with a resolution as fine as three hertz in our standard data products so we're essentially tuning to billions of channels at a time this obviously generates a lot of data we have about eight petabytes of data um, storage on site in these racks uh, and a lot of compute to process that so we do an fft um, typically of the raw data that's coming in uh, to get spectrograms out. Um, so we get intensity as a function of frequency and time. And that's typically the data product that we're actually doing the analysis on. So with 20% of the time on the GBT, those data rates, the raw data rates are huge, hundreds of terabytes per day. And then after we do that FFT and reduce the file sizes down, we're basically generating a few hundred gigabytes per hour, which goes into our long-term archive. This is what we actually get out in terms of those spectrograms. So you can see on the left there, I've highlighted one of these compute nodes, the 64 compute nodes that we're generally actively using for observations. And each of those delivers 187.5 megahertz um, of the band. And you can see uh, on the right, one of those spectrograms there. So you see um, the, the coarse channelization is these, um, these vertical black lines there. And then the overall band pass shape is sort of the change in colors, but essentially those colors are the intensity of the received signal as a function of frequency on the horizontal axis and time on the vertical axis. And you can see, um, you know, it's pretty smooth, but then there is some, uh, there are some signals there, there are some interfering signals that we're picking up. And so, you know, just as with Frank back in the 1960s, the question is, well, how do we distinguish uh, potential techno signatures that are coming from beyond Earth with RFI, with the signals that are coming from our local environment? And what are these signals that we're seeing in there? Are these RFI or are these something that we should be interested in. So uh, even out at Green Bank, um, you know, you can't escape completely from, um, from the modern world. Uh, there are fewer cell phones and Wi-Fi, the microwave ovens in a Faraday cage. Um, uh, a lot of the equipment there is, is um, protected, uh, as, uh, as Karen was saying, including with a new data center so that you're not getting self-interference. Um, but we still, even though we're in the middle of the national radio quiet zone out there, we still can't get away from technology completely. The satellites that are going overhead, and I guess there are people, um, you know, on the tours who maybe are not uh, following the instructions to turn off their cell phones uh, and turn off Wi-Fi because we are still picking up um, some of that. Obviously, much less than we would be uh, pretty much anywhere anywhere else uh, in in the U.S. But there is still RFI to deal with there, and of course. Um, we're not just operating in those protected bands. Um, we're not just looking around uh, the, the neutral hydrogen line. We're not even just looking in the, the L band in the so-called water hole that's traditionally been used for SETI. Now with these wide bandwidths with the 12 gigahertz of instantaneous bandwidth that we have and the receiver suite of the GBT, we're really overlapping with a lot of these other spectrum users. And so it's really challenging uh, to excise that RFI. You don't just want to do regular RFI flagging because then you're also going to excise the signal that you're potentially interested in. So we take advantage of the fact that the GBT uh, has a primary beam that can be uh, pointed at different places on, on the sky um, and enabling us to compare signals that are coming from a target of interest and signals that are coming from nearby positions. And so this is basically how we do it. If you imagine that you wanted to do an observation of the star Vega, uh, we point at Vega for five minutes and then we point away for five minutes back at Vega for five minutes, then in another offset position for five minutes, back at the primary star again, Vega here for five minutes, and then away again for another five minutes. And so these on-off, on-off, on-off cadences, and you see here for another star, taking Procyon as an example here, uh, and you can see 
here, even though you can see satellites in the geosynchronous belt and you can see other satellites that are passing, even some of them coming fairly close to the beam, that we should be able to do RFI rejection by comparing the on-star pointings with the off-star pointings. It's rare for an interferer to be in the beam with those three on observations uh, and, and then not in the beam for the three off observations. So this enables us to do a spatial filter on the sky, uh, which can help us isolate signals that potentially are coming from, uh, from the, the target that we're interested in. So again, this is just one of the, uh, the, the, the outputs from one of those compute nodes. Um, doing this A, B, A, C, A, D sequence. So we point at star A, then at star B, back at star A, then at star C, back at star A, and then at a third offset position, star D here. And essentially the SETI search amounts to, is there anything in the top row of these plots? Here are obviously a cartoon signal um, of what an ET signal, we don't expect that it will look like this. So we don't think they're sending us pictograms necessarily in, in the, the spectra. Um, but if there's a signal that just appears when we're pointed at the star and goes away when we're not pointed at the star, then that's something that we're interested in. And you can see I've also just sort of hand drawn some boxes around other signals here, some of which just by eye you can tell appear uh, in both the top and bottom plots and so are not necessarily a signal that's interesting. Another thing that we take advantage of is there's a lot of broadband signals here, a lot of the RFI is broadband, but signals that are coming uh, over interstellar distances uh, there might be a motivation to make those signals narrowband to maximize their detectability to put a lot of energy into a narrow range of frequencies and indeed th this is what is used for uh, interplanetary spacecraft like the voyager spacecraft you have a carrier signal which is very detectable because it's in a, a narrow range of frequencies and so we did some of these on-off observations of voyager one uh, we did a search for uh, the, the Doppler drifting narrowband signal is a relative acceleration between the space probe in the outer solar system and the Earth, the rotation of the Earth imparting a relative motion there to the signal that's coming in. And so if you look for a signal that's drifting in time and is narrow band uh, over these spectrograms, and again, you're doing the spatial filter where you're looking for a signal that appears only in the, the on-target observations, then you can do a very good job at RFI rejection. Actually, a surprisingly good job. I had a high school a uh, uh, teacher working with me last summer um, who we, we gave this data to, the Voyager data, we asked him to put it through our SETI search pipeline. Uh, so this was X-band data at GBT. So we get um, uh, four gigahertz of instantaneous bandwidth, again, billions of channels. And the only thing that the pipeline found was Voyager 1. And there's actually a nice little tutorial that you can go and look at here that this teacher, Alain Levy, put together. Uh, you can see the stacked spectrograms on the left there, the green, diagonal line is the signal from Voyager 1. Uh, the red line here is just a guideline um, that, that is fitting the Doppler drift of the original signal. And you can see it's there in the on-target scans and it's not there in the off-target scans. And it was actually surprising to me that there were no false positives from this particular data set. Uh, the pipeline was able to identify Voyager 1 as an anomaly, as something that was interesting in the data and to really excise all of that RFI. And so um, this technique is actually quite powerful for doing these kind of techno signature searches. So how are we doing um, with GBT? Well, uh, we're observing uh, over a thousand nearby stars. So this is a volume complete sample and then a larger volume in which we have a spectral type complete sample. We've observed all of those stars in L, S, C, and X band, uh, the main uh, lower frequency single pixel receivers of GBT. We've also been looking at targets selected from NASA's Transiting Exoplanet Survey Satellite or TESS. Uh, we've done over a thousand of those as well so far. And then we've also been looking at the centers of nearby galaxies. And so the uh, required um, uh, luminosity for the transmitters here obviously is a lot higher than for nearby stars uh, and galaxies are extended sources as well. So you can see down at the bottom here, we're gonna have to, for extended galaxies, go back and actually um, uh, for these single pixel receivers sort of tile our observations of those galaxies. Uh, but many uh, of the galaxies actually also will fit inside a single beam at L band. And so we're, we're nearly complete with those centers of nearby galaxies, again, in those same receivers. We're also doing a survey of the galactic center and the galactic plane, and we've done some observations as well of fast radio bursts and pulsars and other targets of interest. Um, so I mentioned TESS. Uh, I had a couple of students that have been working with me, one who has a paper published on uh, searches of targets from TESS. So these are systems that are known to have exoplanets, and the exoplanets are transiting, and so we're seeing these systems in the plane of their orbit, which makes them kind of interesting uh, in terms of um, uh, maybe being more likely to detect signals from those. So one of my students, um, Rafi Trass, has this paper uh, searching for 
techno signatures and observations of these test targets. And then another student, Noah France, who was working with me this summer, has been looking at special times where the systems were actually in transit at the time that we observed those with the GBT, when again, we might be more likely to, to be receiving signals that are coming in. Um, so I'm not going to go into these plots in detail in the interest of time, but these are sort of the key figures from Rafi's paper. And the plot on the right basically is showing you um, a, a range of different surveys that have been done, some with the GBT, some other surveys with other instruments, where if you're familiar with, uh, with radio transient surveys, this is pretty similar to a rate sensitivity plot from transient surveys, but we want to push down into the lower left region of the plot, uh, which is um, essentially transmitters that are faint. So faint transmitters on the x-axis would be towards the left and transmitters that are rare. So on the y-axis, uh, the more um, stars that you can survey then the further down the y-axis you're going. And so the bottom left region of the plot is faint transmitters uh, that um, are not occurring um, in, in very many stars. And so it's hard to get both the sky coverage and the sensitivity, which is why that bottom left region of the plot is not populated at the moment. But uh, the surveys that we're doing with, with GBT and with other instruments are enabling us to push down into new regions of parameter space and essentially to put more and more stringent upper limits on the presence of transmitters that are out there. And so this really is telling us something useful about the population of radio transmitters that are out there in the, the local region of our galaxy. Um, Karen Perez, another undergraduate intern that was working with us, she's now a PhD student at Columbia, uh, has done some Techno signature searches of individual uh, uh, exoplanet systems, but also has been collaborating with Vishal Gajar, uh, who's uh, leading our survey of the galactic center. So, this is with Green Bank and also with Parks, uh, mapping the galactic center, um, deep observations of the center, and also a survey of the bulge. Um, and we're, uh, as well as um, doing the, the SETI searches, I think these data are also useful for um, both for um, new classes of artificial. Uh, dispersed signals so you can also as well as searching for those narrow band doppler drifting signals you can search um, for things that look like frbs but have artificial dispersion and we can also search for natural sources such as pulsars and magnetars and so um, you know we're we're excited to potentially collaborate with folks who are interested not just in the steady side of things but in um, in using our data for other purposes as well Sophia Sheikh, another former intern who's now a postdoc uh, at uc berkeley um, has done some other searches, again, using the GBT, she also has papers about the considerations of what range of drift rates you should look over, um, motivated by, by astrophysics there. Uh, we have some other interns um, that have worked, uh, uh, Casey Brinkman here, um, who worked on some FRB analysis and Jacob Faber as well, again, using the GBT, Casey's paper was uh, uh, GBT and uh, an Arecibo. Um, so the instrument, the back-end instrument that we have is, is really flexible both for doing steady searches, but also it's available for shared risk observations for 50 hours per semester. You can see the website there if you're interested in potentially making use of that, then please do get in touch with me. We're in the process of commissioning the KFPA uh, for, uh, for steady observations, so we've not been using this extensively, but the nice thing with KFPA is it provides you with multiple pixels and so you don't have to do these on off observations you get a simultaneous off observation with your on observations so you can do your rfi rejection more effectively and with the other higher frequency uh, multi-beam receivers the gbt will be sort of working our way up the frequency band we're also excited about potentially instruments like alpaca if that comes to gbt enabling us to do this uh, better rfi rejection at lower frequencies too Another thing that we'd like to do is, so I drew these sort of boxes by hand around these signals, but we'd like to do automated identification and classification of signals that are not necessarily narrowband signals. So here, you know, in the magenta squares, you can see the anomaly, which obviously doesn't look like the other signals. And then, you know, I've drawn sort of colored boxes uh, around things that sort of by eye look the same to me. Uh, the red box that you can see here around this feature at 2400 megahertz it's probably Wi-Fi. So this is probably somebody at GBT, maybe on one of the tours who hasn't turned off Wi-Fi on their phone. And we're picking this up due to obviously the, the amazing sensitivity of GBT. And if we could flag those things out by recognizing them and tagging them using the machine learning algorithm, maybe in the same way that you know Google or um, self-driving cars, uh, these kind of things can identify pedestrians and vehicles and street signs, uh, then maybe we can do a more efficient search um, for, for different kinds of signals, not just these narrow band Doppler drifting signals. So we have some preliminary work on that. Um, former postdoc Jerry Jang had led some of this. We're talking to folks in Silicon Valley. We're talking to folks at Google. 
Um, we actually had a competition with uh, Kaggle, which is a data science platform that's owned by Google. Well, we had almost a thousand teams um, looking at some GBT data in which we'd injected some artificial signals that we called needles that we put into this haystack of data. And we challenged the teams uh, to try and find these injected signals um, and, and to help us develop better algorithms that will find, that will extract these signals from the noise. So this is an exciting area uh, of research. We have a lot of public data. You can go to our public data archive, seti.bogley.edu slash open data if you want to access some of the data sets that I've been talking about. Uh, Gavin Grood, one of our um, undergrads here, has been uh, leading the, the build out of this archival site. So you may find some data in there that's interesting to you. Uh, and I mentioned earlier on as well, if there are folks who are interested in internships, um, those internship applications will be opening in December. And there's the opportunity uh, not just to work with the GBT, but we've had interns working with the Allen Telescope Array. We've had interns working with optical telescopes. We have some cool field trips. We've trained interns up to do uh, observations with our back end on both Green Bank and Parks. Um, so lots of opportunities there. And I hope, you know, again, that you'll encourage folks to apply. Uh, I've really today just given a very brief sort of high level overview of, of what's going on at GBT. We have a whole bunch of other telescopes that we're working with around the world. And I mentioned the TESS mission as well that we're working uh, with um, uh, that's uh, not <laughs> on, on the planet. Um, so um, a lot of stuff going on. I hope you'll check out some of our papers uh, and um, uh, again, get in touch with me if there's more that you want to know. Uh, and then I just wanted to end with this quote again from sort of some of the founders of modern SETI, um, Piconi and Morrison in their paper in 1959. We don't know what the probability of success is for these searches. It's difficult to estimate, but if we never search, the chance of success is zero. And I would add to that, uh, we don't know what the probability of success of Project Osmo was back in 1960, but we know that given the advances uh, in the intervening 60 years, that breakthrough lesson has a higher chance of success than we've really ever had before. And so we're excited um, to be a part of this. We're excited that Green Bank is a part of this. And um, we hope that we'll get uh, some more of you potentially interested in this area as well. You can check us out on social media at Berkeley SETI. Some of you might be interested in um, a VR uh, uh, tour of, of uh, the GBT that we did where we uh, were privileged to be able to climb up and, and uh, ride the elevator up and have a look around. You can look at this in your web browser. If you have a VR headset, even like a Google Cardboard or something with your phone, and then you can actually pan around and see the view in different directions as we ride up there. So particularly for those of you who haven't been up on the GBT or um, maybe who are interested in sharing the experience of being up on the GBT with folks who haven't, then uh, do check that out. It's on YouTube, it's in two parts. So at the end of part one, you'll see a link to part two and I hope um, you'll have a chance to, to take a look at that too. So um, thanks again for the opportunity to talk to you all today, and I'm happy to take some questions. Thanks very much, Steve, for a very interesting and entertaining talk. Uh, please use the Q&A button on the lower right of your screen to submit questions. And we have a few already, uh, kind of generic, uh, general question that you may have already answered about the telescopes playing a crucial role in the SETI project. Uh, do you favor large single dish telescopes or interferometric arrays? Yeah, good question. We like both. Um, so, uh, you know, for the big single dishes, obviously, um, you know, collecting area is is uh, uh, is a big plus. Um, we are also working with um, some of the arrays, particularly the SKA precursors, the Murchison Widefield Array and uh, the Meerkat Array. Uh, and we're also hopefully, I mean, we hope that sort of a broader community will come on board to do technical signature searches with SKA when that comes online. And um, one of the advantages of interferometers is that it enables you to do commensal searches where essentially you have some primary user who's actually pointing the primary beam of those systems. And then you can piggyback and get a copy of the data, usually the same way as we do with our Green Bank instrument. It's over multicast Ethernet. So you can subscribe to a copy of the data without interfering with the primary user. And that enables you then to do your own beam forming within the field of view. Uh, which is, you know, a great way of getting more time. We're not going to get 20% of the time on SKA, I don't think. I mean, if, if somebody wants to give us 20% of the time, that would be great. Um, but, uh, um, you know, I think it, they're, they're very complementary, and I think we're always going to need um, the big single dishes, um, even if it's just for follow-up of, of signal on um, some of those other telescopes, but, um, but also for doing those very sensitive searches, um, particularly for nearby signals. I think, um, you know, GBT is still in a class of its own. And here's a question which in a way is more astrobiology, but um, 
The question is whether anyone's tried to assess the probability of self-assembly of molecules as complicated as RNA or DNA using known rates of chemical reactions. Um, and if the probability is close to zero, would that make many SETI searches useless? Uh, I guess to answer the second half uh, first, yeah, sure. If the probability is close to zero, then we're not going to find anything. I mean, I don't think that makes them useless because I think that tells us something interesting, basically. Uh, the Drake equation, another sort of um, famous uh, thing to come out of Green Bank, and if you go to the Drake Lounge, you'll see it there on the wall. I think probably many of you are familiar with it. Attempts to estimate uh, how many communicating civilizations we could we should see out there by parameterizing uh, that in terms of the number of habitable planets, and then the chance of life arising in those planets, and the chance of that life developing intelligence and ultimately technology, and also the lifetime of those transmissions, how long the transmissions are going out into space. Uh, we know more than Frank did when the Drake equation was formulated in terms of the, uh, the abundance of planets in the galaxy, as I mentioned at the beginning, sort of the, the fact that now, um, particularly from missions like Kepler and TESS, we know that habitable zone planets are common. And so I guess, you know, the, the outstanding question really is this, um, if the conditions are right, then does life arise in those conditions? And I don't think, I mean, I'm not a, certainly not an S, uh, uh, an expert uh, in in the sort of um, the fundamental biological uh, side of this and, and, and in those reactions. Um, but I think this is the question that we're trying to answer basically by going out and doing the survey. Uh, if we do find that, um, you know, if we find life on Mars, for example, or if we find um, uh, biosignatures in the atmospheres of exoplanets around nearby stars, then I think we can conclude that simple life is common and then that will even motivate uh, more the SETI searches um, and the question, well, if simple life is common, is intelligent life common or is that sort of a difficult step to get from simple life to intelligent life? Uh, and I guess sort of my answer, you know, as, a, as an observational uh, radio astronomer is we'll just go out and, and take more data, push those, push the sensitivity down into the bottom left region of that plot that I showed and hopefully make some useful inferences from that. Okay. Um, here's a somewhat technical question. Do you use wavelet analysis at all in, additional, in addition to Fourier transforms? Uh, we have not used wavelet analysis, at least I don't believe anyone on our team has been using wavelet analysis. Um, I think we do want to move more towards using uh, the raw data when we can. The data volumes are a challenge, um, but there are algorithms that would enable us, for example, to do modulation classification. So you could tell the difference between you know, an FM signal, an AM signal, QPSK, all of these different sort of um, encoding schemes that are used. Uh, and having that amplitude and phase information that you get from the raw data uh, provides you, uh, enables an ability to do sort of a richer suite of, um, of search strategies, but it is challenging in terms of those data rates. So, um, you know, right now, I mean, as, as I mentioned, um, it, it's quite encouraging that you're able, that we are able to find Voyager 1 just in a blind search. Um, so, you know, it is a powerful technique, but there certainly is more uh, that we could do down the line, more techniques that we can use. And I think so the wavelets is, um, is definitely something that we'll be worth looking into. Okay, uh, one final question. We have time for one more. And I don't fully understand this question, but um, I think it, it, it deals with the eventual uh, digital broadband silence by evolving technological civilizations. Right. Yeah, I guess the question here is, you know, is Earth getting brighter in radio waves or fainter in radio waves, particularly as we move towards more communications that might be, you know, optical communications over fiber? Um, uh, you know, we're not sort of sending out um, uh, certainly sort of the analog um, uh, TV signals are being switched off. Um, and uh, you know, that, that's hard to say. It's hard to say sort of where we'll be in a hundred years time um, or a thousand years time and whether uh, an extraterrestrial civilization would follow the same path in terms of sort of their, their luminosity. And again, you know, this is sort of one of those unknowns in the Drake equation, the L term in the Drake equation is not necessarily the lifetime of the civilization in the sense that civilizations might blow themselves up or otherwise kind of um, make their planets uninhabitable or, or what have you. Um, but it's also the lifetime of their detectability, so the lifetime over which they are transmitting radio waves into space. And for our civilization, all as we can say is that we know that that's sort of of order 100 years or longer. Uh, and so you can sort of plug that into the Drake equation and make some of your own estimates. There are actually some interesting Drake equation calculators online uh, that enable you to, to do that and to come up with this term, the Drake N, how many 
communicating civilizations are there out there right now? Uh, and again, we don't know. I mean, it's, it's, there's, there's such a, a large possible range, you know, even with some sort of Bayesian priors on this, there's such a large possible range there uh, that I'm, I'm afraid I'm just going to resort to my, uh, my original answer. We need to do the most uh, you know, comprehensive, sensitive and intensive search that we know how to do. And the GBT is a, a key part of that. So we're going to keep looking and we'll let you know if we find something. Thanks very much, uh, Steve, for an excellent talk. Uh, I'd like to remind everyone that these sessions are uh, recorded and you can access them through our website probably in a couple of days. And we look forward to the next one of this in this series in two weeks, uh, Dave Freyer talking about GBT observations of gas in luminous infrared galaxies. Thank you all for attending and we'll see you then.